Hello, everybody. It's Philly Cuts with the Hump Day Hall number 61. You know, every week I get together on a Wednesday with you guys. New comic release day. No big whoop. I review the stack of overpriced new comics because I just can't wait. I got to keep up with the latest on my books that I like each week. And we just talk about what's happening, dude. Uh, getting ready to settle in here. We got about 11 books to review. So I guess we'll just get right to it. Starting off with DC, as I always do. We got a new Batman, number 46, and there is tons and tons going on in here. You got Scott Snyder, Greg Capullo at the helm with the pens. There's so many different storylines going on in here that it's hard to keep up. We learn more about the mysterious villain, Mr. Bloom, who is kind of like this slender man, scary looking dude. You know, the whole creepy pasta slender man thing going on there. We learn more about his nefarious plans and deeds. Not only that, but we learn more about what Commissioner Jerry, I forget her last name, she's a female, short blonde hair and a power suit. You know what I'm saying? She, uh, in the last issue, has requested that Jim Gordon, who is now the Batman for Gotham City, she's requested that he step down. And in this issue, we also learn that there are going to be a Batman. There's going to be a Batman in every city in the DC Universe. That's Jerry's plan, at least, as you can see. You see the army? They're prototypes, Jim. They're going to be everywhere. And we're also introduced in this issue to a brand new bat cycle, man. A motorcycle. Check that thing out. That's pretty badass, isn't it? It's fucking OC choppers right there. But there's more. There's even more stuff in here. Batman, after a five-year drought of no romance, no love in his life, other than the nefarious joker and the back and forth that goes on there. He has proposed to Julie Madsen in this whole stunning sequence in here. That's right. Bruce Wayne, you know, the Batman that now has amnesia, doesn't remember anything about being Batman, has proposed, folks. And we learn a lot about Julie Madsen's links to uh, Batman's parents that were killed and the links to Joe Chill. If you didn't know, Joe Chill was the name of the villain that killed Batman's parents. So we learn a bit more here. You know, tons and tons going on here. I'm very, very surprised, in all honesty, at how long Snyder has kept the, uh, you know, Bruce Wayne amnesia story and the Jim Gordon as Mecha Bat going on. So I don't know. What do you guys think? What's the over-under on this that that's going to keep going? You know? Because is it getting a little played? Are you getting a little tired of Jim Gordon as Batman? You know, the, explora the exploration of what the symbol of Batman means to Gotham, what, what that means, the force behind it. Not just the man, but, but the idea, the symbol, the bat. Um, also, we learn more about the new Robin in here. I guess his name is Duke Thomas. I don't know anything about it. Uh, I don't know if this is a carryover from the We Are Robin uh, comic, that new series, because I haven't read that. I don't know anything about it. Um, but he definitely makes an appearance in here. Um, let me see if I can get you a quick picture. There's kind of his suit there. So... New Robin. So, looking forward to it. It looks like it is setting up that this is kind of a setup issue for the Robin War, another massive DC crossover event. And look at all those issues, people. Looks like it's about 10 issues, so have fun. I'm trying to lay off of that kind of stuff. You know, I'm learning my lesson. All right, Batman. Superman, number 26, we got this fellow here on the front with the dagger is known as Vandal Savage. He's this thousands-year-old dude 
who uh, is proving to be quite a match for the still depowered Superman. Uh, if you've been reading Superman or any of the Superman-related titles, you know that Clark Kent, a.k.a. Superman, is severely depowered. He, he's lost most of his super's abilities. He can't even fly. He can still do kind of super jumps. Um, doesn't have, you know, the X-ray vision and all that crap. Still has some super strength. But this Vandal Savage, uh, there's a plot against Superman that is revealed in here. And it turns out that Vandal Savage is up in Antarctica. He's been stockpiling uranium. It looks like he's taken the natives up there hostage, using them as slaves to guard this uranium. And this uranium has a link to Superman being depowered, okay? So this Vandal Savage character is uh, much more important than we may have anticipated. I kind of just thought he was just kind of a throwaway, you know, D-list character that they were kind of putting in there. And it turns out he's not. So I guess time will tell. Now Batman has recruited, or Superman rather, has recruited the help of several bats, as you can see here. We have Batgirl, we have the Red Hood, and then we also have Grayson. And if you've been following this series, you know that Jim Gordon, Mecha Bat, is not really a friend of Superman in this series. In fact, he actually told Superman to get the hell out of Gotham and don't come back. Will they reconcile in this issue? Oh, we have to see. We can't tell. All I'm going to do is show you a panel here. Guns a blazing, friend or foe, Batman. Superman, the only way you'll know is if you buy the book. Or, you know, look it up online and download it for free or something. All right. The search for the comic book cover of the week for me is over. I don't even have to go through the rest of the comics. Look at this cover, people. The Looney Tune variant covers this month have been infinitely way better from what I can see than the Monster of the Month variant covers last month from uh, DC. Uh, this is just phenomenal, man. I am in love with this cover. As a matter of fact, after uh, I'm done reading this, I'm putting this on my freaking office door at work. This is going to go on the outside of my office door. I've already decided I'm in love with this cover. Um, it, it reminds me of... Uh, a Monster of the Month variant cover, not this past year, but the year before, where Catwoman uh, had a jack-o'-lantern. It was just very simple. It was Catwoman sitting at a table with a jack-o'-lantern, and the top of the jack-o'-lantern was off, and then in her hands, she she like pulled out a whole bunch of jewelry out of the jack-o'-lantern. And just the, the, the look on her face and just everything that that stood for, I just thought that was great, and I was never able to score that variant cover. And when I knew that this one was coming out, I knew I just had to have it. Okay. Now on the inside, the writer Genevieve Valentine, she has been writing for this book for the past year. Now her tenure as Catwoman ends in this issue. This is the final issue that Genevieve Valentine will be writing as far as I know. I mean, who knows in the future? You know, writers always come and go. They they always come back, cycle in and out. But for now, this is Genevieve Valentine's final issue. Um, You know, I struggled with her writing for quite a long time. You know, she weaved quite a tale of Catwoman as crime boss, as crime overlord. Uh, Catwoman has become the leader of the Genovese crime family in Gotham and she was out of the cat suit for most of this uh, year long run. She was out of the cat suit she was assuming the title of mob boss uh, and, and I struggled with that and it, and it was a very very slow burning story you know, very very slow, almost like a novel you know and as time went on um, it really kind of grew on me and I actually kind of liked it, and I really started looking forward to reading Catwoman. Uh, as a matter of fact, Catwoman, uh, you know, the past like month or so, uh, month or so, past three or four months 
or so has really become one of the books that I read first um, out of my hall. Um, so I'm going to kind of miss this whole saga. Um, Genevieve did also a lot of things to expand the character, not just by, you know, increasing her three-dimensionality, um, but also explored her uh, sexuality as well. Um, in this run, it was revealed that Catwoman is indeed bisexual, and the person that she had love interests with was none other than Aiko uh, Hasegawa of the Hasegawa Crime Syndicate. There she is there. Interestingly enough, while Selena Kyle was out of the cat suit, Aiko donned the cat suit and actually, you know, went around Gotham as a, an, another cat woman. And it kind of got her into trouble. It got her into some trouble. Um, and Catwoman had to bail her out a few times, and it really showed kind of the deep caring that the characters had for one another. Well, things have kind of gone to shit. Um, Iko's father ends up getting killed uh, by the Black Mask, and she is upset about it. Um, and in the beginning of this issue, she in fact actually rounds up the heads of... 15 of the smaller families, uh, crime families of Gotham, she rounds up 15 of the leaders and she plans to assassinate them. Uh, Selena gets wind of this and ends up having to try to stop her. And that's kind of like a showdown that they have in this issue. So friends and lovers quickly become foes in this. Also, uh, Iko does kind of blame Selena a bit for her father's death. So there's that interesting twist there. Um, and they have a great showdown in this where lots of words are said, uh, lots of the reasoning, too, behind why Iko is doing what she's doing with assassinating the 15 smaller heads of Gotham's crime families. It's more than just revenge. She hopes to... Uh, kind of implement a level of peace in doing that um, it's interesting um, and the team that's going to work on Catwoman next in issue number 47 it's going to be Frank Turi the writer I'm not familiar with him and the artist is Anaka Miranda I believe and it's going to be a return to Catwoman doing uh, some heists and apparently she's even going to be getting out of Gotham so I guess Selena needs a vacation. She needs to be far removed from all the politics of Gotham and all the nonsense and chaos that's ensued from her being a uh, crime boss. And if you've been reading this as well, um, it's been set up and established in the last couple issues that she actually handed over the reins of the Calabrese family to uh, Antonio Calabrese right there. So... Or actually, no, that's, Jesus Christ, that's Iko's assistant, Antonio Calabrese, who's also blonde. Oh, my God, I can't, sometimes I can't tell them apart. It's actually her right here. Looks very similar to her assistant, but there, that's Antonio there. So, actually, you know, I'm going to miss it, man. So long, Genevieve. If you want to keep catching her writing, I guess she's going to be doing uh, Batman and Robin Eternal. I guess that's the, the weekly series that's been out. Um, I've thought about checking that out, but I think I'm going to have to sit that one out because I already buy three Batman titles, and I've tried before to try to do a, a weekly Batman title. It was Batman Eternal, and I just I couldn't keep up. I just couldn't keep up, and you know, asking twelve dollar another twelve dollars a month for another Batman title is just a little bit too much, too rich for my blood at this point. I'd rather buy some independent books. All right. Finally, from DC, I picked up Constantine the Hellblazer, number six. This is the start of the second story arch called Get a Job. Now, Constantine returns back from England. Uh, if you were following this series, you know that he was in England uh, having some issues with a former past love. Uh, this love interest um, was kind of terrorizing Constantine in a way. 
Uh, Constantine has also lost his familiar ghost friends. If you know that Constantine always kind of had this posse of ghosts around him that kind of kept him company. This kind of explores this a little bit further. He returns back to NYC, and he's kind of struggling with being alone. Uh, so he puts an advertisement in, like, Craigslist. Here he is in his undies, dude. Just kind of chilling in his apartment, you know, scratching and sniffing. Just with his socks on, you know. Kind of like a Sunday, you know what I'm saying? And he decides to put an advertisement into like a Craigslist type of thing, as you can see. Very handsome exorcist will solve spookiest problems. And it's kind of funny. They kind of take him through every part of the city uh, doing exorcisms and stuff like that. There he is fighting a demon that's kind of crawling on top of the ceiling. He's going through all parts of the city. Greenpoint... Koreatown? I don't think there's such a thing. I guess that's a play on Chinatown. Bay Ridge. Etc. Etc. And all the hijinks that are involved with that. Eventually he runs into this old gargoyle character who knows Constantine. I guess they've forged a relationship. And this gargoyle character kind of tells him of an impending doom that is about to happen with the magic of New York City, and that the only person that can help and save them is Constantine. But alas, is Constantine up to the task of doing this? Does he want to do it anymore? It seems like he's getting a little bit burnt out from all the work that he is doing in the city. I mean, there's just so much for him to do. And it's kind of funny, man. They do about, like, 15 different panels of him doing that stuff. So... You know, Rasputin just ended that comic book that uh, I was kind of kicking myself for buying for 10 issues. This has the art team of that comic book series. Riley Rossimo is the artist. Ivan Palencia is the colorist, and they do a great job. That was the one thing that I did love about Rasputin. Um, some teams just work good together. Um, and this is one of those inking and coloring teams that are just on point. Uh, it reminds me very much of Dave Stewart and um, Max Fumiara of Abe Sapien. It's just like the coloring and the artwork for that book just go hand in hand. You know, it's kind of like one of those deals that I just love. I just love the way that these guys can match things up together. So... It's kind of cool to have that going on. One thing that really irked me in this, because I'm a big Hellraiser fan, I read Hellraiser, so Constantine has to get rid of some of the monsters that are in his apartment, and what does he use? He uses some kind of fucking box that is straight out of Hellraiser, dude. That's the fucking lament configuration. I mean, come on, man. I mean, come on, that's straight out of Hellraiser, so... That kind of irked me. All right, Marvel, I'm just continuing to buy the Star Wars issues. This week we have Darth Vader number 12. Darth Vader continues to hide things from this investigator, Tanith, uh, who's been on to Darth Vader. Darth Vader stole like a whole bunch of money from the Empire. Tanith was sent in to help Darth Vader investigate this. But Darth Vader has to throw this Tanith guy off his tail because he doesn't want to get caught, you know. Not only that, but Darth Vader uh, is trying to find out the whereabouts of Luke Skywalker. That's basically been the whole premise of this series. You know, he needs to find Luke Skywalker because Luke Skywalker blew up the Death Star. Last issue, there was this character introduced known as the Ante, who is an information broker. The Ante knew, knows the whereabouts of Luke Skywalker. Now, one of the people that Darth Vader has hired is this archaeologist. Kind of reminds me of Laura Clo uh, Croft. Um, her name is, Jesus, I wrote it down, Dr. Afra. Now, Dr. Afra found out about the ante, too, on her own. And she actually beat Darth Vader and Tanith to the ante and has learned the 
whereabouts of Luke Skywalker before Tanith and Darth Vader could. So the way the last issue ended was Tanith and Vader were on Afra's tail. Afra flies into this crazy storm cloud, gets kind of cornered by the Empire in this storm cloud, and this picks right off from where that left off. Does she get caught? Do Vader and Tanith get the woman? It's interesting. It's interesting. It's just kind of good cat and mouse kind of comic book and it's kind of cool that you know what's going on with Darth Vader and this Tanith character doesn't so you have that whole element to it Um, you learn more of the motives of Aphra and she is paired up right now with the two assassin droids BT and Triple Zero who are just fun fun characters and love to kill man alright Chewbacca number three I am sticking with it the, you know, each month a new book will, you know, release like a little synopsis of a book, right? Darth Vader, or Chewbacca number three, I swear to you, the synopsis for this book was literally, it was Chewbacca speak, three lines of Chewbacca speak. I mean, what? What the hell? Anyway, this is just kind of a very simple buddy story. This is part three of five. I like it. It's very simple. Um, it kind of just shows that Chewbacca is a really stand-up Wookiee. And he's loyal. And he's helping this young girl save her father from the clutches of an evil gangster. This gangster has enslaved a whole bunch of people. And they're mining like an ore or something. Some kind of metal. Some kind of element for the Empire. So that the Empire can use it for some type of uh, weapon or ammunition. You know, so pretty standard, pretty straightforward um, story. Nothing that special to it. Um, It's just kind of cute. Kind of touching. It kind of shows that Chewbacca is, is a bit imperfect. He's a bit goofy. Last issue, we learned that he was afraid of, like, sewers and confined spaces. And this one, he's kind of, like, getting himself in trouble, hanging off of a branch or a tree or something. And uh, he just seems to get himself into trouble. But he's a stand-up dude. I like the artwork of Phil Noto in this. There he is hanging off of a tree and getting sucked into quicksand. Um, The writing by uh, Duggan, I don't know what his first name is, Jerry Duggan, like I said, just pretty straightforward, pretty standard, strange buddy pair-up story. So if you're into that kind of thing, check out Chewbacca. All right, I got three books, three books from Image. Descender starts up again, and let me tell you something. This is the adventures of Tim 21. He is a boy android. Uh, The trade comes out today, along with issue number seven. So you can get issues number one through six, trade form for ten bucks. I mean, you can't beat it. If you order it online, it's even cheaper. I think you can get it at, like, cheapgraphicnovels.com for, like, six bucks and probably the other graphic novel places online. You can't beat it. Uh, Phenomenal, phenomenal story. I'm going to read the synopsis real quick because they do it way better than I do. Um, So this is what happened in the first six issues, pretty much. A decade ago, massive robots dubbed the Harvesters suddenly appeared in the orbits of each of the nine core worlds of a collective of planets known as the United Galactic Council. They activated and wreaked havoc on mankind before disappearing again. Fearing a link between these harvesters and the millions of robots that the UGC employed as companions and workers, anti-robot culls swept the galaxy. Ten years later, the UGC is in ruins and almost 90% of robots have been hunted and destroyed by mercenaries known as scrappers. One robot who survived is a life-like young robot named Tim21, who's basically like a little boy, and you really... Uh, start to fall for him. You know, that's the great greatness of uh, Jeff Lemire's writing, is that he can really get you to connect to a character. Um, 
So Tim 21 is the last survivor of a distant mining colony with only his small pet bot bandit and the lumbering mining bot driller to keep him company. But the UGC has learned of Tim 21's existence and thinks that he may, in fact, hold the secrets of the harvesters in his unique machine DNA. The UGC dispatched a science team that included Tim 21's creator, the brilliant Dr. Kwan. They rescued Tim 21, Bandit, and Driller, but soon after a team of scrappers boarded their ship and brought them to the planet Ganesh, home of the anti-robot Culls. There, Quan was tortured and admitted that he is a fraud. He did not create Tim 21 after all. Immediately after this stunning confession, a group, the underground robot resistance, a militant group called the Hardwire, launched a rescue mission for Tim 21. The Hardwire's leader, a robot named Pisces, then introduced Tim 21 to his doppelganger brother, Tim 22. So this picks up right where it left off. Stunningly, in the first uh, sequence of the book, we're introduced to kind of an ice world. We're introduced to this strange character. I love, I love Dustin Gwynn's artwork. This guy is one of these robot hunters, and he catches a group of robots who are just lowly farm robots. You know, they're they're, they're workers. And they're pleading with this guy, please, don't kill us, don't dispatch us. The human beings that are here, that we work for, they depend on us. If they don't have us to work, they'll die. And it kind of leaves you at a cliffhanger. It shows this guy again. And then it goes right to the title. And then it leaves you wondering, what the hell does this guy do? Is he going to kill those robots or does he have a heart? So... Right away, I'm pulled right back in, you know. You almost are like, Jesus, can, can they top the first six issues? And by any indication, it looks like they might. So, pretty cool. All right, also from Image Comics, I got Birthright, number 11. This is the start of the third arch. This is an issue that really delves back into Mikey. Mikey's... Uh, Younger years on the fantasy world of Torinos. Um, Mikey basically is a kid who, at a very, very young age, he went missing. And he was gone for a year. Disappeared for a year. Only to reemerge as a hulking Conan the Barbarian-like brute. That's what he returned as. Um, he's this guy right here. That's Mikey. The guy with the ponytail. Now, that, that kid with him is actually his older brother, okay? And he's trying to figure out what the deal is with Mikey. Mikey seems to have some uh, strange leanings, uh, a little bit of evilness to him. And this kind of explains why. It kind of shows the formative years of Mikey while he was in this other dimension, Torinos, which really could be a very foreboding place. Uh, has places named like the Swamps of Serenity and the Fields of Forever. I mean, this is another issue, another comic that is very, very, you know, high fantasy. So if you're into kind of like, I guess, you know, World of Warcraft, Dungeons and Dragons, that kind of deal, if you like spells, if you like mages, you're going to really love this book. Um... Joshua Williamson is the writer. If you don't know him, think of uh, Nailbiter, which is a great book, great horror-themed book. Um, just great, great stuff in here. Creepy characters. I love it. So I'm going to be sticking with this for a long time, and I'm glad to have gotten in on that from the beginning. Drifter, this is the last story of the second arc. Um... The tagline, all it says is uh, the world burns. And I didn't even read the last issue, so I can't uh, recall what exactly has been going on. Um, the protagonist, uh, Abraham Pollux, has basically, he's trying to find a way home. He's trying to find his ship. He crash-landed on this planet, and he's in 
he awakens from the crash. He thinks that he's only been out for like a couple days or so, and I think it turned out he was out for like three years or something. So there was some kind of time displacement going on. There's strange creatures in here. There's themes of religion. Um, Vic Klein, or Nick Klein rather, is the artist. He does all the coloring, all the artwork. I really think that he's the star of the show in this. Just great, great art, great, great world building. Um, and he's like the, a master of the purple and the lavender coloring, man. And you guys all know that I've, I'm a sucker for that. I'm a sucker for that type of coloring. So I don't know. I might not pick this up in single issues after this here. Um, I may trade weight it. Um, it's not going to come back, folks, after this issue until April 2016. So I do have a ton of time to think about it. Do you recognize the artwork on this cover? If you read Outcast, you'll you'll get it. It's Paul Azteca. I got the variant cover. So I love Outcast, so I had to pick that one up. Dark Horse, I got two issues. Harrow County, the hills are alive with the sound of music. Isn't that what you think of when you see that there? Master of Horror, Cullen Bunn. He can write Cullen, Cullen Bunn can write horror. Aquaman, not so much. Not so much. Um, this has delved into being a real tale of two cities kind of story. You have two sisters, Emma. She's a country girl. Um, she's learned that she's had these creepy powers. She is the daughter of a witch. Um, her sister, who was separated from her at birth, uh, her name is Cammy. Cammy's from the city. She's wealthy. She has money. She has embraced her background of coming from a mother who was a witch. And this whole issue is basically Cammy trying to recruit the haunts or the ha haints. I think it's called Haints, which is a name for like a monster, for a creepy crawly. She goes into the woods of Harrow County, and she basically tries to recruit these monsters. Here she is eating a plate full of like maggot-filled drumsticks, of all things. You know, with wine, of course, you know, you gotta sucker that down with a nice Chianti. Anthony Hopkins style. <laughs> with some fiber beans. She's making friends with the monsters in this issue, folks. Tyler Crook is the artist. Just amazing, like, watercolor-type stuff in here. Beautiful artwork. I mean, I got so many good artists this month, this week. Uh, it's just phenomenal. Here she is kind of trying to recruit this guy in the tar pit. And I'm just wondering, like, to what end? Why is she recruiting all these monsters? What is she up to? Uh, Emma is much more cautious, much more fearful of the monsters. Um, she kind of is still trying to figure out everything, you know, that she's able to do, her abilities. Um, there's some skin-crawly, creepy creatures. So it's going to be really interesting to see where this goes. I'm looking forward to it, man. All right, and then finally, Abe Sapien, number 28. Abe's down in Florida. Stuff is going to hell. The world is in a handbasket, and Abe is still learning his connections to all of this hell on earth. And it turns out that he is actually a new breed of man. He is the first of a new breed of man, it is revealed that is going to inhabit the earth once all this destruction comes to bear. And he has some individuals talking to him, telling him all of this. BPRD connections, folks. Lots of BPRD connections in this. There's lots of flashbacks in this. Um, I think it takes place um, like about 10 or 12 issues ago in the current BPRD uh, storyline. So the timeline is a little whacked out. Um, but again, I love the artwork of um, Max Fumiara paired up with Dave Stewart, who does like every 
every like Mike Mignola book on the planet. Uh, Scott Alley is the script writer here. Just good stuff, man. Abe Sapien, probably my favorite character of all the BPRD. And I'm really enjoying this series. And that's it, folks. Went a little bit long this time. Let me know what you're liking, what you're disliking. I'd love to hear your comments and just uh, let me know what you're buying. And if you have any recommendations, I'm always open. I'm always all ears. And I'll try to buy a book or two uh, based on your suggestions. All right, guys, it's been another Hump Day Hall in the books. Number 61. Have a good week. Peace. Bye.